welcome to the Progress Summit. Um, how has your Progress Summit been so far? I think on the side there. On the side. Oh, oh there we go. I'm, I'm having a great time. It's great to see people out of Zoom, off a Zoom room. I'm used to every little squares around everybody's faces. So. I, think I think it's should. on. Is it? Is it on? Okay. Yes. Hey, yeah, okay. Well, uh, well, I, I'm glad to be here and uh, thank you for having me on this panel. And it's great to be, to, to be back uh, on stage or in presence, uh, not only on uh, screens. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to start our conversation today, you know, around the world, we've seen the resurgence of far right that, quite frankly, liberalism and especially conservatism seem ill-equipped to fight. Uh, this is the case today, as it has been throughout history. And so to both of you, in that fight, what are the challenges and opportunities for social democrats in Germany, Europe, and Canada right now? And I think we'll start with Nils. Well, I think the, the most important challenge uh, for us has been to bring political debate back to bread and butter issues. Um, uh, so when uh, the SPD lost the provincial elections in Baden-Württemberg in uh, 2016, and I lost my ministerial post. <laughs> um, the campaign in my home state was all about um, uh, refugees and uh, the risks of um, um, decreasing living standards uh, for the German population because of the influx of refugees. And um, over the last two or three years, all major democratic parties in Germany understood that um, campaigning on immigration was a very bad idea, except for the far right. And even the Christian Democrats in Germany refrained uh, from focusing too much on immigration and refugees. And uh, so we, had, we, we came back to the rather traditional political cleavages about tax increases or lowering taxes for the rich, uh, so social security, the minimum wage, uh, the um, transition uh, from fossil fuels to renewable energies and stuff like that. And I think that was key uh, for the success of um, uh, social democratic parties uh, in, in many European countries. Um, if you only talk uh, about immigration, uh, you are lost as a social democrat. Yeah, I think I think that's very good advice to stick to bread and butter issues. I think that's true for us as well. You know, I, I think always the secret to when the Democrats win is because we talk to people about where they are at in their lives and things that are going to make a difference in their lives as soon as possible. Like I always think in my head, you know, having canvassed, many people in this room have canvassed, what, what do you say to the woman who answers the door and she's got a kid on her hip? and she's got maybe 30 seconds to listen to you. What are you going to say to her in that time that's gonna to connect to her, make her believe that you have something to offer and make her believe enough in that that she's gonna go out and vote and, and try to be guided by, by that. And you know we can have much more theoretical conversations and deeper policy dives and our 18 point plans and all the rest of that. But if we aren't convincing people who are struggling that we have an offer that is gonna materially improve their lives in short order, then we aren't going to be successful. No, and that, that cuts right into the next thing here, because talking about bread and butter issues at the doors, you know, we see election after election that campaigns matter. So, you know, in last year's federal election in Germany, the CDU and CSU led in the polls until the SPD surge in the final weeks of the campaign. Uh, but before this campaign, what groundwork, to Nils, what groundwork did Social Democrats in Germany have to gain to accomplish this? Like, what changed this time around in 2021 to allow the SPD to break through? I think... Um... What really was important was to uh, draw the lessons from uh, uh, two uh, defeats in the former elections. Um, and that was um, unity within the party, um, uh, deciding quite early on the candidate, on the chancellor's candidate, which is a very important feature of our electoral campaign in Germany. Uh, it all centers uh, on the character, on the personality of uh, the uh, 
the chancellor's candidate, and we uh, choose we chose Olaf Scholz very early, um, and we built the whole campaign around him and his uh, major uh, political propo uh, policy proposals, and uh, this was um, for us a stark contrast to electoral campaigns in uh, 2017 and 2013, where we more or less sort of stumbled into the campaign and were ill-prepared. And then there was one last uh, thing uh, I would like to add, that uh, we had a plan. Uh, and uh, it sounds funny, but um, after a very controversial debate within the party, if we should again join a grand coalition led by Chancellor Merkel from the Christian Democrats in 2018, the party leadership decided that this time around, um, we would not only focus on delivering um, results as uh, government ministers in different policy fields, but that we would also concentrate on um, creating a more visible political profile of the party, although being part of a coalition government, um, because uh, social democrats in Germany love to govern, they love to implement policies, but sometimes they forget to sell the, these policies and these uh, uh, political results to the public, and then all the uh, value, political value, all the political benefits accrue to the Chancellor's party, which was the Conservative Party. But this time around, we agreed upon a division of labor. So we had a strong political leadership with our party leader, Andrea Nahles, um, who was also uh, the leader of the caucus in parliament. And we had very experienced uh, uh, government operators in charge at different ministries, uh, and the leading one of those was uh, Olaf Scholz as vice chancellor and minister of finance. And the idea was uh, for Nales to keep uh, the party alive, uh, and uh, uh, not only alive, but vivid, and to uh, uh, for Olaf Scholz to do the job and to position himself as the national successor candidate to Angela, Angela Merkel, because it was clear that this would be her last term. And so Olaf Scholz uh, positioned himself um, as the chancellor in waiting, as the natural successor to uh, Merkel. And the plan went only uh, uh, well to uh, to a certain extent because we lost an, <laughs> our party leader <laughs> during the term and then there was another very controversial leadership uh, com uh, uh, contest within our party. But at the end, Olaf Scholz indeed was the chancellor everybody waited for. Uh, well, we had to wait for the polls um, uh, at the end of August to show this. But um, many of us had been convinced from the very beginning that this was the right choice, that under these circumstances, uh, we just needed to have a sort of uh, very seasoned politicians to succeed to uh, Merkel, a guy who was already in, in place, well known to the public, had high personal approval ratings, uh, and uh, could be entrusted uh, with government uh, uh, from the very first day in office. So that, that was the strategy behind um, uh, to, uh, to um, show that the SPD was a responsible coalition partner, but at the same time uh, to show a sort of new horizon of uh, a political vision uh, beyond uh, compromises we had to uh, agree upon with uh, the Christian Democrats uh, in, in our coalition. Dr. Jennifer, um, in Canada in the same way, how would you characterize the NDP's results in 2021? What were just some of the pivotal moments of that campaign? 
Well, you know, it, it was a very unusual campaign, and I'm not sure that, you know, there's much that we'll see that kind of campaign again. I mean, it was unusual in the sense it was during a pandemic, and so a lot of the things that we would normally do, we didn't do. It was a campaign that nobody really knew why it was happening or what it was necessarily about. It was, you know, in the middle, in midterm uh, of a minority government when the government decided to pull the plug. I, I am proud of our results. Our vote grew at a time when the other parties vote did not both those but the, both the conservatives and liberals and the greens to a great extent lost votes we grew but it's not a satisfactory campaign because we didn't win enough seats and that that is at the end of the day how you measure the success of, a, of an election so i i feel like it was a building campaign for us um, i think we were much more competitive than we were in 2019 i think our leader jagmeet has just grown in experience we knew that he was well liked but one of the questions I think that kept coming up in, in some of our research, you know, people loved what we were talking about, they thought Jagmeet was great, they felt like we were understanding their needs, they just weren't confident we could actually do it. And that to me is kind of a bit of the heart of this agreement that we've entered into. We, we have to prove to people that we can do it. And that means two things to me, and from what we hear from folks, they need to believe that we are not putting forward ideas and policies that are so big and so many years from now that they can't be done. But we also have to prove that we have the chops to govern. And, and we know that, those of us like me, you come from provinces where we have governed, that's not a hard sell to people. But federally, you know, we still have to get people there. So every time the conservatives talk about the NDP government, I would wish they would put a few million dollars behind an ad that said that, so that we could get people to think about us as the government. So that, that is part of the opportunity in this agreement. And I mean, you know, aside from having the conservatives do our work for us, how do you, like what Mills said previously, how do you sell that then to Canadians over this uh, next three years of, uh, of the agreement? Mm -hmm. Well, I was really interested in what Niels was saying about, you know, we, we are going to both have to continue to talk about things like dental care and pharma care and the other achievements, which is, you know, in many ways a governing party communication strategy. And we're going to have to be critical of the things that are not yet done along the way. And so I was really interested in what he was talking about, a division of labor. I think that's something that we will also have to have to think about. But I think we're, you know, that to in large measure, this news of the last week has really punched through. And many, many stories from Ottawa do not punch through the bubble. This, I think, has. But we're going to need to continue to talk about it, hold the government to account, go out and talk to people about what dental care can mean in their lives. We've gotten such tremendous stories from people about what this could mean for them. We have to keep channeling those stories, repeating them, and reflecting them back to folks. By keeping in bubbles. Um... With the Ottawa bubble and in the Berlin bubble, we like to hear kind of the inside scoop. Uh, in working with other parties, how do you stay true to social democratic values and advance your agenda in coalitions and cooperation agreements? I, I think with, with Nils, how did the SPD in, in particular forge its new coalition? What are the challenges, opportunities it offers in, in terms of delivering change for regular people? This is much easier to be done if you uh, are uh, at the top, at the, uh, if you had the government. So with the chancellor's office or the person of the chancellor from our party, uh, we can send much stronger political messages. And um, that's why for us, it was um, very important to translate uh, the three main political themes from our campaign into the coalition uh, agreement and into day-to-day -day work uh, of the federal government. Um, and the three main themes of the campaign were respect. So the idea of um, granting respect to everybody, regardless of its education, professional background, uh, age, uh, and, and position in society. And this was um, um, sort of embodied by one signature policy proposal, a hike in the minimum uh, wage from 9 euro 36 to 12 euros. The second pillar of the campaign was 
a huge conversation about the transformation of our industry, uh, transition to renewables, uh, just transition as you uh, frame it here, uh, that um, this is a huge opportunity for creating new and sustainable jobs, not a, a um, idea that you should do less and less and that, that you have to uh, avoid doing this or that, but you can continue to live a decent life, uh, but you pollute less and you uh, uh, you uh, uh, do more for, for, for protecting the climate. And the third uh, pillar was about a stronger, more sovereign Europe. So this was the foreign policy dimension and a very strong pro-European uh, commitment uh, from, from our uh, chancellor. And so what we had to do is just uh, to, to pick the chancellorship, what we did, because we, we are the strongest party in parliament and we had the right to negotiate a coalition government um, and then to have uh, some concrete policy measures integrated in the um, coalition agreement that uh, could prove to our electorate that yes, we are, we, we are staying on, on course. Uh, we do what we uh, promised to do before the elections. So we are still the same people. We are still on the same path. That's very uh, important to have this coherent policy approach um, because this builds trust. And this was very impressive to see our uh, leader or chancellor candidate switching in the first gathering of the newly elected MPs uh, from his candidate role into uh, the clothes of uh, the new chancellor by just telling us, okay, now look, campaign is finished. Now we've got work to do. And that's why for us during the coalition negotiations, it was so important uh, to push through some of our very significant um, uh, parts uh, from our campaign platform. So the, the, the minimum salary is part of the coalition agreement against the uh, resistance of one coalition partner, the liberal party, which is really liberal in economic policy. And so they uh, are opposed on minimum wages on, uh, on, on ideological grounds. Uh, we did not find common ground with them on other very relevant policy fields like tax policy. So there are no tax increases in this uh, coalition agreement. Although the Green Party and we would love uh, to increase taxes on high incomes or to raise the inheritance tax, uh, but that was not possible. And so during this, uh, this kind of coalition agreements, it's give and take. And you have to understand that it's all about compromises. You will not have 100% of your party platform uh, seeing implemented. And um, the one of the very um, positive uh, things about uh, coalition negotiations is uh, building trust between the um, coalition partners. And I think that was also what NDP and uh, the liberals did here in, in Canada, just by talking uh, about policy, uh, you find some, some confidence, some, you, you learn, you get to know each other much better. And uh, this is a, a good start uh, for common ventures, <laughs> so to speak. And um, in our case, this was a, this was a, a negotiation, negotiation process over several weeks with working groups on, I think, 16 or 15 themes. So I was part of the working group on foreign uh, and defense policy. And in my working group, we had six representatives of uh, each party, 18, and staff. And they took notes. And uh, together with the other working group groups and one leaders group, six high level representatives of the uh, three parties, we produced a coalition agreement of more than 150 pages. So very detailed um, information about the bills we want uh, to uh, submit to parliament, 
about new programs uh, to be implemented, about policy guidelines in different, in all fields of uh, political activities. Um, and it's also a reassurance for every coalition partner that um, feed that um, topics which are very dear to the party base uh, uh, will be um, implemented in the following or uh, in the ongoing term. Um, uh, at the beginning of coalition agreements in the 70s, um, these were only some dozen pages or 20 or 30 pages. And now these uh, manifestos have grown <laughs> in volume mm -hmm. um, because politics has become more complicated, but also because um, uh, we want to make sure that signature proposals from every party um, will show up uh, in the uh, coalition agreement and also in the working, in the day-to-day -day workings of uh, the coalition government. 150 pages. Yeah. <laughs> and just on, on security policy and international affairs or? No, no, on the whole. The, the whole, whole thing. Yeah, okay. the whole thing. Security. Otherwise, it's like one uh, yeah, part of the But, but it's, it's, it's really the Bible for, the, for this term because every party can return to the text we've put down and um, tell us, okay, look, that's what we have agreed upon. Now uh, let's do it. Uh, but as we've seen this, the war in Ukraine, <laughs> of course, there are events that trigger new initiatives which were not foreseeable. And so if you are swift enough and smart enough, you can insert a policy proposal or a policy from your party because of uh, changing circumstances. So for example, uh, in the last grand coalition under Ms. Merkel, there was a big scandal in the meat processing industry in, in Germany. This is the one with the horse. Uh -huh. is, is the horse meat, is that? Is no, 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 no. That's it's, another it's, one. Okay. It's labor conditions okay. of those working in the meat processing industry because there, there's many, there's many, there are many immigrant uh, workers there. And uh, so uh, there, there were, were a lot of sub subcontractors involved, uh, which did not really apply uh, the working uh, rule, labor rules. And so our minister of labor took advantage of this scandal by introducing new legislation that was not provided for in the coalition agreement, but political pressure was so high that this was the right moment to do it. And maybe there will be room for a debate on tax increases in the years to come in this term because of uh, uh, and new circumstances um, arising because we have to invest more in resilience and uh, also uh, more in defense. Yeah. So to Jennifer, I mean, this all sounds like a very similar story. Building trust, having these things written out in an agreement might not be 150 pages. No, I think it's two and a half two and pages. And a half pages. <laughs> we get it done with less paper. Maybe, that's, maybe, that's maybe 50, that's 50 years from now. I mean, what you're describing sounds more like an NDP platform process to me than a, <laughs> what this agreement was. But but then getting to the bottom of that, like, yeah, uh, you know, we hear about trust. And so there are similarities between um, the German coalition, this Canadian coalition. Um, it's not a coalition. So how is it how is it different than a, than a German coalition? Well, it's not a coalition. We don't have any. We don't have any spots in the government. We are an independent opposition party. I'm. I'm not opposed to coalitions at all. But that's not what what this agreement is. And I don't think you know, honestly, like we we are not an equal enough partner in terms of power. I think to make a coalition actually work for us. Um, that's not what what this is. But you know, I think going into it. Yeah, I mean, there is some trust building, some confidence building. And it was very helpful that a lot of the conversations happened between the leaders. And so they had a high degree of, of trust and confidence. And then it was a very small group of staff that worked at the details. But in terms of values, I mean, we, you know, we went in pretty clear and what were no go zones. And we and we were you know, said that some of the, you know, worries that people had is, oh, what if they do something that we just can't vote for? And and one of those examples was back to work legislation. So we were clear in those meetings, like we are never going to vote for that. You can declare it confidence. You have many 
partners in the House that will vote for it, we are never going to vote for it. And there was at the time a threat of, uh, of that coming to pass. So I think you're clear where your lines are. But there's a lot of other stuff where there is enough agreement, right? And we didn't linger on places where there wasn't a lot of agreement. We tried it out. Not, there's no agreement on electoral reform in terms of proportional representation. So we didn't stay there, right? We moved on to things where there was some agreement and where we could get things done. And so, like, may, may, may I just jump in because uh, what you are telling uh, or describing is a debate we had um, in uh, after the elections in uh, autumn uh, uh, 2017. Um, there was a debate uh, about the SPD joining again the a grand coalition because another potential coalition collapsed uh, 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 short of the finishing line. Uh, really really a, quite a disastrous moment for all the parties involved, not for the Social Democrats. And then the, the Christian Democrats turned to the SPD in order to propose another grand coalition. And at that moment, we were tempted to do what you did by proposing uh, just a sort of minority government supported by SPD without having SPD ministers in the government, but uh, providing a majority, especially for the election of the chancellor. Um, and at that moment, we did not choose this path because in a parliament with a rather conservative majority, which was the case back then, so there was no progressive majority in the German Bundestag, we preferred to have a coalition, not in order to advance policies in many fields, but just to prevent a potential conservative majority uh, to um, uh, pursue anti-labor policies and to weaken workers' rights. Uh, and that was the reason why we uh, agreed to do or to, to particip participate in, in this uh, grand coalition again. It was not so much about a positive majority in order to change things because we had not the partner for that. It was about preventing uh, liberals and conservatives of uh, pushing their neoliberal agenda um, in the field of renewables, uh, social security, healthcare, and labor market reforms. Uh, and uh, uh, so that so we had a similar debate uh, Although this is not at all in the German tradition to have minority governments, but then uh, we did not uh, pass the Rubicon, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, because we preferred uh, the security of a coalition agreement, which means that on every proposal and bill submitted to parliament, coalition partners vote uniformly. And so still keeping on the, uh, the coalition talks, like both the, uh, in the case of Canada and in Germany, you know, both of these situations were big news. But Kano um, Überraschungen, or no surprises, was the feeling a lot of folks got on the way the coalition government was formed in Germany regarding the partner, party, partner parties, the distribution of cabinet posts. And then in Canada, no surprises was literally in quotation, like in the prime minister's readout on the liberal NDP parliamentary deal. So my question is, are we really that boring and predictable? <laughs> like, how, like, no surprises is, is a fact of, of both of these conditions. Yeah, how does that fit into the way that social democratic parties govern? Well, I mean, for us, part of what it means is making sure that we have an opportunity to have uh, meaningful input and feedback, right? It doesn't mean that they may still do something that we disagree with, but we want to know about it, and we want to know about it with enough time to have input and possibly change it from happening. Some of what Niels was saying, like part of this too is to try to prevent bad things from happening or worse things from happening. So that is part of it. And it also goes to that, you know, we are, we are building trust, but we aren't there yet. 
And, you know, so I think that that is another part of it. What we mean by no surprises. Look, if you're going to bring something in that you think we're probably not going to agree with, we would like to know about it before you do it so that we have a time to change your mind. Or if we don't change your mind, you're, you're going to know what our criticism is going to is going to be. And I think that is essential to having that kind of basic trust that makes this sort of agreement possible. I think that uh, no surprises uh, does not mean no changes. Uh, so, um, but changes sh should not come as a surprise, but should be uh, debated before, and the electorate should know what we are about to do. So, I, I just want to recall a very famous uh, saying by Michel Rocard, a French socialist, um, and he said, um, uh, "Dire ce qu'on va faire, faire ce qu'on a dit." So you should say what you are about to do, and then you should do what you said in the campaign. <laughs> That's a very basic uh, democratic principle, which should especially apply to us social democrats, because um, we want to change things in society, in the economy. And uh, so uh, we should prepare the voters uh, for uh, the we should convince them of the necessity of change, and we should prepare them uh, that we will change things, but they can rely on us that this will not um, uh, Im imperil their way of life and the future of their uh, kids. And I think, so now we are not boring. Uh, or <laughs> we, 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 we are very assertive uh, in terms of uh, willing to, to uh, advance uh, progressive causes. Uh, but it should not come as a, as a surprise. That would be very bad, I think. And I don't think anything in this agreement is a surprise. We were also really clear that we were going to put in there the things that we've run on over and over again. And some of the things the liberals have run on over and over again. So it's not a shock what our priorities are. And, and I think, you know, after the 2019 election, we were asked, like, what, you, what is going to be on your list? What is your red line? And I think, you know, Jigmeet said often, like, it's not a shock. Like, the stuff we run on is the stuff we actually want to do. So that's what we're looking to do. Those are the things we want to accomplish. And I think that's faithfully laid out in the agreement as well. And, and please allow me to bring in one anecdote, because there was one time the SPD joined a coalition where we created a big surprise. That was in uh, 2005 when the Christian Democrats ran on a proposal to increase the VAT by 2%, two percent, two points, two percentage point, points, and the SPD opposed it in the campaign. And afterwards, we formed a coalition uh, government uh, and agreed uh, to increase um, the VAT by three percentage points. <laughs> Uh, which was very, very uh, positive for the budget, but it really um, uh, destroyed uh, SPD's credi credi credibility uh, to a large extent. And so better to have no surprises. And so without surprises, you know, it's still these two governments are still very relatively new. Um, this traffic light coalition, uh, you know, it's, it's governed at the Landa level. But it's never been before a federal type of government. And you know, some compare today's Singh Trudeau deal to the Douglas Pearson deal for Medicare in the 1960s. And so given these experiences, what can we expect from your two respective governments over the next few years? We have a few years of uh, stability. Um, but what can we expect to see if there are no surprises, if we have this path forward laid out? Um, any thoughts on what's on the paper and maybe what's not on paper. Um, you know, I think we're going to be pretty focused on making the things we agreed on real. Like, I think achieving something like dental care, which let's face it, I like the last time a national social program and an expansion of healthcare, I I wasn't alive, I don't think, in this country. So that is going to take a lot of work. So we're going to focus on doing the work to get there. I don't know what the future is going to look like. This is, we haven't done this at the federal level before. Um, you know, I am hopeful that we are going to be able to achieve some really meaningful change for people who are coming out of you know two years of a pandemic and many other big struggles in their lives. But, you know, I think it's it's going to be up to us now to make this agreement real and, and to never let up. Um, for the traffic light collision in Germany, 
it's too early to tell. Uh, so the jury is, is still out. Uh, you cannot judge if it's a really transformative coalition. So it's a new coalition. The first time we have three parties involved on the federal level. Um, and as such, it's new. So um, after 16 years of Merkel, a new chancellor, a new coalition, uh, unprecedented coalition, that's quite a change. <laughs> Uh, not, not too much change, but it's, it's a change. And now the question is, will it be as visionary and as transformative as other new coalitions, first time unprecedented coalitions in, in German history have been? Um, so if you take the first social democratic liberal coalition in 69, this was unprecedented as well. And it was Willy Brandt's and Helmut Schmidt's coalition uh, that uh, governed throughout the 70s and uh, really completely um, changed uh, West Germany. Societal reforms, economic reforms, the new Ostpolitik detente uh, policy. So that was huge. And then, uh, in 1998, the first red-green governments, meaning social democrats uniting uh, with the Green Party to form a new coalition, uh, uh, took power. And this also was quite a transformative coalition because they decided uh, to exit from nuclear power. They created the uh, feed-in tariff for renewable energy. Uh, they um, introduced um, same-sex marriage, uh, so they put they 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 introduced the human right dimension to um, uh, to foreign policy. So this was really a a reformist coalition, and now with the liberals partnering for the first time with Greens and Social Democrats, it's uh, not as evident to um, dub it a progressive coalition. Well, we, we deem it a co progressive coalition because well, at least we have some missions so, uh, for progressive reform that can be implemented in this term. Uh, some other causes have to be left aside like uh, tax equality, but there is enough stuff for a four-year progressive uh, term, and uh, in education, in in uh, industrial policy, in society societal reforms, e on on immigration and integration, um, on European policy, so I I'm, I'm rather optimistic about the reformist and progressive character of this government. Um, but it's not as clear as the uh, in the other two examples uh, I've mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned Ostpolitik because I'm going to turn a bit to foreign policy here, uh, which is your specialty. Um, the question of NATO has always dogged social democratic parties in the West. Historically, the NDP has opposed involvement in the alliance with rather lively debate, as we've seen throughout history. Uh, the SPD's position on the alliance has also evolved along with the junior coalition partner Greens that now hold the foreign office post. The Greens, in fact, were established in the 1960s to oppose Germany's involvement in NATO. And you know, asking uh, friends in Berlin what the, uh, the climate is, they, they use the, um, Chancellor Schultz used the term Zeitenwende, or turning point, uh, to describe Germany's new foreign policy. And you know, meanwhile, the NDP is calling the Trudeau government out to scrap the F-35 deal. Uh, with geopolitics, again, ending the end of history, do you think that within social democratic parties that there's still room for debate on matters of international affairs? Well, there needs to be uh, much room for debate. Um, but when it comes to NATO, we've more or less come to terms with it. So um, in the history of German social democracy, there was a time in the 50s, 
in West Germany, when the SPD opposed what we called rearmament, so the reestablishment of uh, West German military forces. And the SPD also opposed um, West Germany joining NATO. And, um, but with a famous speech by our uh, parliamentary whip, by, by our leader of the caucus in, in the Bundestag in June 1960, the SPD dropped opposition to NATO and to the Bundeswehr, our armed forces. And from that day onward, um, it, it was considered to be a responsible party, which could be trusted in foreign policy as well under the circumstances of the Cold War. Um, and that led uh, to Willy Brandt's chancellorship. And uh, under his leadership, uh, West Germany invested more than 3% of GDP on, in defense. And it was uh, Willy Brandt who started a fighter plane project, the Tornado fighter plane, which is capable of uh, dropping atomic bombs. Um, so this is our uh, contribution to so-called uh, nuclear sharing with, with the NATO. And uh, so the SPD after 1960 has never been a anti-NATO or anti-military party, uh, quite, the, quite the opposite of that. And major military investments and equipments either were decided by Willy Brandt or by Helmut Schmidt. And the strategy of our armed forces is that uh, during 16 years, the defense minister was not from the SPD, but from the Christian Democrats. And uh, that's why uh, there was underinvestment and uh, not so much respect uh, for the role of, of the military. Um, the most popular defense ministers in, in German uh, post-war history were uh, social democratic uh, defense ministers. They were um, held in high esteem, not only by the soldiers, but by the electorate uh, at large. And uh, so for us, um, NATO and nuclear deterrence has always been somehow part of the internal debate, but in, in uh, practical government uh, politics, um, it was not put into, into doubt. What played a role is the experience of the 30 years after the Cold War, uh, during which much emphasis was put on the dialogue side and not so much on the deterrent side uh, for evident reasons. And to come back to the Seitenwende um, uh, question, now with uh, the turning point in history we've reached with the Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, for understandable reasons, we are going to shift more on the deterrent side and we need to uh, invest more on defense uh, without giving up on dialogue and diplomacy, of course. But there is, uh, in our relationship with Russia, now much less uh, space for uh, diplomacy because they do not want to have diplomacy or civil society support uh, coming in or economic exchange going on except for oil and gas. And so um, we have to adapt our policies. But this is a not a fundamental change in our conceptual framework. It's still about dialogue and deterrence, but it more 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 uh, deterrence more stressed and resilience more more emphasized. Um, and so, in in our view, spending or creating a special fund of 100 billion euros uh, for the equipment of our armed forces is no contradiction uh, to pursuing domestic reforms um, within the framework of our coalition agreement. Um, so um, what we are trying to do is to leave the ordinary budget in place, not to burden it with additional uh, uh, defense spending, but to use a very complicated constitutional amendment uh, uh, to uh, take uh, to to spend 100 billion on on military purchases. At, at the same time, all other topics of domestic reforms can be financed and followed up uh, through the ordinary budget and. 
coming back to Willy Brandt, this was his recipe of, for success. He was strong on security, but at the same time, he created the conditions um, for a modern Germany by modernizing its economy and its society. And that's also what we are about to do, uh, to uh, deploy the necessary forces and weapons and troops uh, within NATO to defend our uh, territory against any aggression and to deter Russia. Uh, but at the same time, this conflict or this long game we are in with Putin is also about us, about democratic societies being able to deliver prosperity and equality and wealth and sustainability to, to our economies and citizens. And that's the best thing we can do in this in this uh, competition with uh, autocrats. Um, and so um, we do not put too much emphasis on this defense thing. And I hope that my party will not start an internal debate on this too much, because we are we are staying on course uh, of, of domestic reforms. So I, I don't think it's accurate to say that we're anti-NATO. I, I don't think that is accurate. I think we've had a position for a few elections now where we support Canada's involvement in NATO. There's people in this room much better equipped than I to speak about that. And I think in this current situation, we have seen the importance of acting with other countries, right? I mean, Canada on the world stage, we have to act with other countries. I don't think the kind of sanctions that we've seen come in place would be as effective as they are if there wasn't some coordination. And I think similarly with military spending, although, you know, it's much to be critical of the way military spending is done in this country, the way military procurement is done in this country. The other thing that's true for us as a party uh, of workers is that if we are going to have a military, if we're going to have people go into danger, we want them to have the equipment to do the job and to be safe. We have members of parliament who represent those families. We hear stories where you've got members of the military having to jerry-rig parts for helicopters that probably shouldn't be in the air anymore. That's not okay. We wouldn't tolerate that in any workplace. So I think we have to be clear-eyed about, about the place of, of the military in Canada. I think we can be critical. And we have a rich tradition of people being very you know, critical of militarism and escalation. We also want dialogue and democracy. I think Canada can play a much better role in that. I think in this current situation, we are not adequately um, addressing the needs of Ukrainian immigrants who are coming here or Afghani immigrants who are coming here. We're not playing the role that we should be to welcome people and provide safety and security. But you know, I think we have to be clear-eyed and, and allow ourselves to be complex about some of these very complicated issues. There are multiple viewpoints within our party, that's fine. But you know, I think in the, in the current situation, we have a military, they should be equipped to do the job that they should do, and Canada does need to act with our partners on the world stage. Thank you. Turning back to social policy, and I think we have to wrap up very soon, but uh, you know, there's no doubt that it's social democratic parties that lead the way on progressive change. From the 12 euro loan federal minimum wage in Germany uh, this year to the real legacy of Canadian healthcare, it's social democratic parties that make this happen. Yet there are those who still say we're not doing enough. Uh, how would you address that complaint? Um, how can the left bring back voters who have lost faith in the system entirely? Well, I, I agree we're not doing enough. I don't, I don't think we should disagree with that. Like, like there's not enough for me either. We're, we aren't doing enough. There's more that we should do. How do we bring people back? I think something that Neil said very clearly is, you know, we have to remain credible. We have to say what we're going to do, and we have to do what we're going to say. Uh, but again, I think it comes back to where we started, talking about bread and butter issues, really demonstrating to people that we have solutions that are going to impact their lives in positive ways quickly, that we aren't talking about 10 years from now and restructuring the entire economy necessarily overnight, but that we there are some things that we can do quickly that are going to really impact people and building from there. I, I, you know, there's much criticism in our movement about incrementalism. Honestly, most actual real social change that is durable happens by increments and steps at a time. It doesn't generally happen in one big fell swoop. 
Yeah, I agree. And uh, there must be a sort of productive tension between reformism and government participation on the one side and a sort of overshooting ambition, um, visionary, visionary thinking on the other side. This is what makes uh, social democracy uh, attractive. And I think um, Social democratic parties have always been especially successful when they um, achieved to sort of sustain this tension um, while in power. Uh, so in Germany, for example, we in, in my party, we have a tendency uh, to um, long for the purity of opposition politics. And then I always tell our uh, fellow comrades, just look at the Social Democratic Party in Bavaria. They've been in opposition for 60 years now. They've always been uh, pure. And they are now at 9% at the l last uh, uh, regional elections. And um, many, the time when the SPD attracted many new members, was not the time when we were in the opposition. It was the time of Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt. And so um, I just can quote another famous social democrat, our former party leader, Franz Minterfering, who just uh, told us that opposition is shit. Um, it's, it's so yeah, uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's it. That, that seems a good place to end. <laughs> Oh, so thank you to Jennifer and Nils. I believe that's all the time we do have for a discussion. And on behalf of the Broadband Institute, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to engage with us on this very valuable transatlantic discussion that I'm sure we'll all take with us forward in charting the path forward for a more, more progressive victories to come. So for everyone, we now have a coffee break followed by continued programming in this room. I think it'll happen a little bit later. Um, and then there's also program of programming, of course, elsewhere at the Progress Summit. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm.